Because thermocouples are so common, because thermoconduct. <laughs> uh, because thermocouples are so common, silicon making you. <laughs> oh my god. If you're trying to measure temperature using electronics, you have a few different options. And the less expensive ones, the ones that are gonna be the most accessible to somebody who's either just getting into this or as a hobby, are going to be things like thermocouples, thermistors, and RTDs. Now, if you read the title of the video, then you already know that I'm going to talk about thermocouples because that's what I'm going to use in the SMD reflow oven. But it actually makes sense for us to explore the other options and figure out why it is that I decided to use a thermocouple over other options. The other two devices that I mentioned, thermistors and RTDs, are both resistive devices. It turns out that their resistance, the resistance of the device itself, actually changes in response to temperature changes. RTDs are usually made out of really specific materials, typically platinum, and those materials have a very linear response in resistance with respect to temperature. If you looked at a graph of the temperature relative to the resistance of an RTD, you would see a nice straight line, which means that we get a very predictable result out of an RTD. It makes it really easy to measure temperature accurately. On the other hand, thermistors tend to be made out of far less expensive material, and so they cost a lot less than RTDs, typically. But the price you pay for that is that the materials that they're made out of are often a little less linear than the things that you would find in an RTD. But you'll notice that I'm saying that we have to be measuring things that are usually under about 100 degrees Celsius. And if you know anything about soldering, you know that solder typically has to get up to about 250 to 260 degrees Celsius. And so we can't really use those devices to measure the temperature of our SMD reflow oven. And so enter the mighty thermocouple. Unlike our resistive devices, a thermocouple can often measure temperatures up into the, you know, thousand degree Celsius range. And that means that this is a perfect candidate to measure the temperature inside our SMD reflow oven since 250 degrees Celsius is well below the ceiling for something like this. But now this works differently than the devices that we talked about before. If you take a look at this one, and now they come packaged in all sort of different things. Sometimes they'll have a big probe on the end and, you know, a bunch of other nonsense, but this one in particular just looks like two pieces of wire that come up and then they're welded together at the tip. Kind of no big deal. This just looks like a piece of wire. But now that weld in the middle is the important part here because the two wires that have been welded together at this tip right here are made of two completely different materials. And that, it turns out, is how this thing works. There is a very nifty physical effect called the Seaback effect. It tells us that if we have two different materials where they connect, if we were to, to apply a temperature difference between this point at the weld and this point down here where the wires are exposed again, we will get a potential difference between these two points on the other end of the wire. And the difficulty is that the amount of potential difference, the amount of voltage that we get over these two ends of wire over here is very, very small. In fact, if you measure it with a multimeter, you will see that it is down in the microvolts range. But now this is a big deal because if we want to amplify the signal, and of course we will, that means that our amplifier is going to have to have nearly no offset voltage at all. And very, very low offset voltage uh, amplifiers are very, very expensive. On top of that, any sort of noise that's involved because of the board or the construction, or all sorts of other things comes into play, which makes these very kind of picky little devices. It also means that they can't be quite as accurate as the RTDs that we were talking about earlier. But since they are pretty much the only device in our price range that can measure the type of temperatures that we're looking at, we're pretty limited to this. But luckily we don't have to worry too much about the actual amplification of this thing. Because thermocouples are so common, semiconductor companies actually make ICs that have only one purpose and that is to amplify and clean and you know communicate the temperature measured across or the voltage measured across this thermocouple and that is exactly what we're going to use in this project uh maxim makes a 
product that I've already forgotten the name of. We're going to be using the Maxim 31855, and that's the, the K model. And you'll see that they call that a cold junction compensated uh, thermocouple to digital converter. Just kind of a mouthful, but it should make sense to you already. We obviously want to get the voltage that was measured across this thermocouple out of an IC somehow. And one of the ways we can do that is have a chip that actually communicates it into a digital signal so that we actually just will get some value out of this chip and that value will represent the voltage difference, the potential difference across the thermocouple, which will then translate translate into a temperature thanks to the data sheet. And now this device is an SPI device, which is great because in a previous video, we set up SPI devices, saw how they work. And so it should be no big deal for us to hook up and read the temperature off of this guy. There are a handful of other options for this. Uh, some of them use different buses. There's a very popular one that uses like a one wire bus. Uh, if you're comfortable, obviously you can try something like that. There's also versions of this technology that output an analog signal, which make them pretty much amplifiers. And then you can just read that analog signal with your own ADC, uh, maybe one of the ones that's present on your microcontroller, and then, you know, use that to get the temperature, uh, you get the idea. Now, the reason that I specified that this is the K model is that it turns out there are many different types of thermocouple. Uh, the K type of thermocouple is actually probably the most common one that you see uh, because it's relatively inexpensive and, you know, it has a pretty nice temperature range. You do tend to see maybe the J and M ones out there from time to time. I've even seen some E's, but they're actually something like a dozen or more really commonly used ones. So if you're going to use something like this, make sure that you take note of the actual thermocouple that you buy, because when you get your thermocouple IC, it better match that type. So, all right, that's kind of everything we need to know to hook this up. So let's do it two different ways. The first time we'll just do it really quickly with an Arduino since that's easy enough. And then we'll do it again with the STM32, which is what we're using in our SMD reflow oven, which is actually just as easy, but YouTube gets me more hits if I use the word Arduino somewhere in here. So here we go. Now, as far as I'm aware, pretty much all of the uh, thermocouple ICs, especially thermocouple to digital, uh, run on 3.3 volt uh, power lines. So an actual you know, Arduino, a normal Arduino, uh, works on a five volt power rail. You can't just hook those two things up on the same power rails because you're going to explode your thermocouple IC. So just make sure that you're aware of this and hook the thermocouple IC up to a 3.3 volt uh, power supply instead of a five volt power supply and then when you hook it up to the arduino which you know we'll see in a second uh it shouldn't make a huge deal uh it's been my experience that the arduino reads signals from 3.3 volt ic's without any problem even though the logic signals don't quite match 3.3 volts is usually high enough to get a one at the at a digital input on the arduino and now the setup straightforward if you check out the data sheet you'll see you know the pinout of the device itself actually the hardest part of doing this the the hardest part of getting this all connected is that uh, you know in, in my case anyway I got uh, surface mount uh, ICs I'm pretty sure they only come surface mount anymore you might be able to find older ones through a source that are through hole but I don't have that source so I mounted them on a surface mount to through hole uh, board you know it's like a little adapter type board uh, it's easy enough to do I'm not gonna have like a soldering tutorial here you can check out you know I'll link something in here that you can check out to, to figure out how to do that. But once you get it all soldered up and ready to go, hooking up the pins to an actual Arduino is really straightforward. You know already what the different SPI pins do, because again, I had that video before. And then the only pins that are left are the supply lines and the two thermocouple pins. And of course, when you buy your thermocouple, it'll tell you, you know, which side is positive and which side's negative. And so you can hook this up the right way. And now the only other pertinent information from the data sheet is what the actual digital out signal looks like. So it turns out that the output from this device is 32 bits long. So you're going to need to do, if your device like your Arduino only does eight bit SPI reads at a time, then you have to do four reads in order to get 
all of the information out of the IC for one given temperature measurement. But then once you have that, there's the little table in the data sheet that tells you how to translate the data you got out into you know actual results that you can take a look at. And then further down on the data sheet, the numbers that you get out of this device, you can then use the little mapping to figure out what the temperature is. And so now here I have a whole little setup and you know a sketch open and ready to go. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's just going to be an SPI read. And then you can see a little bit of um, computation down here where we actually extract those values from the values that we read off the SPI. And then we use that to figure out the actual temperature. And I have them output to the serial monitor so that we can take a look and, uh, and see what that actually is. And I have this happen once per second. And now I'm not gonna go over step by step how this sketch works. Uh, I will link it in down below. It's got some comments in there, but it's pretty straightforward how you know the functionality here works. So I, I think if you just take a look at the code, you should be fine. Now we save and upload the sketch and we take a look at the output on the serial monitor and we see our 32-bit value. We break that down into its separate components and then you know we can translate those into an actual temperature, which seems pretty sane to us. That's the temperature of the room, give or take. So we're good, this thing works. Now, obviously you can use this information to do all sorts of things. You know, you could trigger an alarm for a certain uh, temperature range and all that sort of stuff. Uh, in our case, we're gonna have it, you know, once it hits a certain temperature, it will turn on or off the heating coils in our toaster oven. And, and in that way, we'll try to match the SMD reflow curve, you know, to, to solder the boards correctly and stuff like that. So, okay, so let's see how this all would work in the thing that we're going to use for that, which is uh, STM32. And now if you didn't see the video on STM32, I have a few of them. I'll link them in here somewhere. So I don't really have to bore you with all that stuff. Instead, let's just get right to it. So you see here that I have a program open. Uh, you should sort of have an idea of how all this works and how to get it set up. Again, if you don't check out the previous videos, they tell you how to get this all set up. And so the code is just ready to ready to go. And if you have been following along, then this sketch should look just just as easy as the Arduino sketch. All we're doing is taking four SPI reads from the IC. We're, you know, we're gonna take that data and break it up and parse it and compute you know, all our values properly so that we get our temperature, which is the exact same thing we did with the Arduino. Again, I'm not gonna go step-by-step step over the code uh, because I'll link it in down below on the GitHub. You can go there and uh, check it out yourself. The only thing that's really different here with the STM32 is I'm going to output the temperature to a little LCD display uh, and that way you know once a second it'll refresh and we can you know see real time ish the temperature of the room or whatever it is that I you know put the thermocouple against and so now getting everything hooked up sure enough we see that it works exactly as we expect uh, it measures the room temperature you know pretty much perfectly and I'm getting the temperature of myself to be somewhere around what I expect if I put a little heat to it we see the temperature go up accordingly and that will do it. We still have one more step left before we put the SMD reflow oven together and that is to turn what we did today into a PID controller but I'm not sure if I'm going to make that a separate video or maybe I'll just put it all into one and then we'll have our SMD reflow oven. Either way keep an eye out for that. If you enjoyed yourself today make sure you hit the old thumbs up down below, uh, subscribe, the alert bell, uh, leave a comment down below and check the description. Uh, I, like I said there'll be the, the code will be down there and I'll probably put like circuit diagrams and stuff like that, as well as links to the previous videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.